introduce our very special guest, the director of the film, Ira Sachs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Brian. Uh, this is a pretty special festival that you have here. Uh, I just learned that nobody is paid anything who works for the festival, and all the programmers are here because they love cinema, and they love movies, and they love movie theaters, and it's a real honor to be a part of the festival tonight. I, wa uh, I want to thank and introduce just two people who are uh, part of the producing team on Little Men. Uh, this is a Chicago hometown event for them. They're both from here, and they have a lot of their friends and family here, Jeffrey Leving and Joe Delamonica. Uh, this is a film really about uh, neighborhoods. It's about the changing nature of cities. It's about friendship. It's about many different things, which we can talk about afterwards. I'll be up here um, to discuss the film. But really, it's about what happens between people in their own homes, in their own communities. Um, and for me to be with the film uh, in Chicago with this group of here, of people who are here tonight, all of you, is what makes it actually very special and very human. Uh, I'm excited for you to see the film, and I'm excited to talk with you about it, and thank you so much. Not after I press it. Um, is, okay, got it. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Scott Tobias. Um, and I'll be, you know, connecting the Q and A and hopefully opening things up a little bit uh, for for the rest of you. Uh, but please, for now, uh, welcome back the uh, co-writer and director of the film you just saw, uh, Ira Sachs. Okay. Um, everyone loved this film, right? Surely. Uh, it's just so, such a powerful film, and it's so, one of the distinguishing features of it, and of your work in general, is it's just, it's so real, and so specific, and so, so understanding of the way the world works. Um, what, how, how did, how did the screenplay come together? What, what, what informed the screenplay from, from, uh, real life? Um, well, thank you for that introduction and reception. Uh, I, this is the third film I've written with Mauricio Zacharias, my co-writer on Love is Strange and Keep the Lights On. And we have a, we've developed a process where we, uh, we spend a couple of weeks, maybe four to eight weeks, talking about movies and life and stories and what's going on in our families and our relationships. And at some point in this process, we saw two films by the Japanese director Ozu. Um, the first was called I Was Born But, which was made in the 1930s, and the second was a remake he made of his own work called Good Morning. And they're both films about kids who go on strike. And we thought that's a good idea for a film, two kids who go on strike against their parents. Then there was the question of why, and that's where it sort of became more contemporary to us. Um, we, uh, Mauricio, every time we would meet, would tell me uh, about something that was going on in his own family. His parents live in Rio, and they were in the process of evicting uh, a, a woman who owned, ran a store that they owned the building of. And I would hear these different uh, events, and I would think, well, there's definitely another side of the story. There's another story to be told, which is her story, the woman who's actually getting kicked out of this place. And so it became very resonant because um, having moved to New York, like any city, is a city full of evolution. Uh, I moved to a neighborhood of, Blo of Brooklyn, which was Italian neighborhood, a Dominican street, and I was the white college kid who came in to take one of the apartments. And um, I will say within three years, none of the Dominican stores on our block were there anymore, so I knew that very well. Um, the last thing I'm going to just say in terms of, there's a million different inspirations, but I just want to say one that's relevant tonight. My best friend growing up um, was uh, a boy named Greg Isabel, um, who's here tonight to watch this film. So I'm very happy to have Greg here. And was, that, was that relationship, did that inform the film as well, and how, how did that? that come to play? Well, Greg would have to answer that also, but um, I will say that, you know, we were really close from 
uh, I guess around maybe second grade until we went to seventh grade, and in seventh grade, um, uh, he his family moved out of Memphis, um, and there was uh, a, a break, I would say, and I'd, so I think that break reflected our experience. We were also from very different backgrounds uh, in Memphis. Greg's father, I hope it's, it was, was brand Stax Records in Memphis, and he was one of two black kids, maybe three, in our very, very white school. And um, so I'm sure that has its own story. And we were um, extremely close. And then I would say the way life does, and also the way adulthood does. As kids, you're able to cross boundaries in such a different way than adults seem to be able to manage. And that was something that I knew very deeply. I also was involved in a theater program when I was a kid called the Memphis Children's Theater. And we were all so different. We were black and white and gay and straight and from the um, you know, poor, poor neighborhoods and from the suburban neighborhoods. And somehow we managed to make theater together. I've never seen that re repeated as an adult at all, that kind of kind of bridge that people were able to make when they were under the age of 13. Um. So, so talk about, I guess, um, the casting of the boys, because uh, they're really exceptional in it, but it's not always an easy thing to find, you know, uh, young, young actors who can pull, pull off roles this, this complex, so how, how do they get cast? Uh, you know, I'd seen a film called The World of Henry Orient, if anyone remembers that, with, with Peter Sellers. And there's two girls in that film, and they're, they're incredible. And I, and I kind of knew from that film that I needed to find kids who would be interesting to me, who would be original, and who you could never forget somehow. I didn't need to find, it wasn't like finding Judy Garland in The Wizard of Oz or something like that. They didn't, they didn't need to be the one kid and there'd be 10,000. So I, um, uh, I work with A.V. Kaufman, who's a casting director in New York. She has done a lot of, of very successful kids casting. She found the kid in The Sixth Sense. She found the kid in um, uh, Searching for Bobby Fisher, the kids in The Ice Storm, the kids in Life of Pi. She's like a kid whisperer. Sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, through her channels, uh, I met Theo Taplitz, who played Jake, and he's, he sent in an audition um, from Los Angeles, where he, where he grows up. And literally, though he was working with my script, it was as if it was a documentary about the kid in my movie. It was so organic and comfortable. Uh, his relationship to the text, cast him basically the next day. I had a few open calls in New York. I put up a sign, I didn't personally, but someone put up a sign. I used to, most of my films, I'm the one who put up the sign, but in this one there was another guy. And uh, at the Lee Strasberg Institute, um, where, is, where method acting originated in New York City, been around for you know 80 years, and they, um, one kid, Michael Barbieri, has been a student there since he was nine, he's now 13, he saw it, uh, his father um, took the, down the information, and he came in for the call on the day that I cast Theo, so, and he came in to read for that part, and I said, okay, switch parts really quickly, and um, he was just so incredible as a kid that I knew somehow I needed to make it work that he would be in this movie. And, and I wanted to say two things about Michael. One, he has recently been accepted to the LaGuardia High School for the Performing Arts. <laughs> and two, right now he's in South Africa shooting The Dark Tower with Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> second one. So he's, he's a talent to be uh, a, lot, well, a lot to be expected from. And, and how did these boys get, get along? I mean, was there a process of, of them getting to know each other, of them being able to seem like friends? Um, you know, boys, kids, and I would say actors in general understand that you need to make relationships really fast without any history. These kids had an instinct for that. I often, I don't rehearse my actors in advance of shooting, so we have no formal rehearsals. Uh, we don't read the script together. We don't work on scenes together. I talk to each of the actors individually, but one thing I've learned to do is, is to create situations where they can spend some time together. Um, it seems to work even though it's very minimal. So for example, these two boys went out to a movie together and then I think had lunch and hung out for an afternoon and somehow, and, and actually they practiced a lot of skating together. And the combination was they got really, really comfortable uh, really fast. Um, so, where, um, you know, one of the standout elements of, of 
you know, little then for me in this, you know, in this conflict between the, the, the adults is that you really have a full understanding of where everyone is coming from, uh, but not necessarily, um, but there's a balance that you're sort of holding there. Where, where do you want the audience's head at as far as this whole conflict is concerned? It was important to Mauricio and myself that we not, um, in a way, give anyone too many of the, the, the winning cards or the losing cards. So um, there's no real victim, there's no uh, real uh, kind of villain in the film. In, in a way, what we tried to do is make them very close to each other in terms of class. Um, Paulina Garcia's character, Leonore, is a well-educated woman, but she's a recent immigrant. Um, and so she has a, she's kind of been pushed down a class from where she probably originally came from. Um, Greg Kinnear's character is in part of what we call the creative class. He has also inherited this building, but they were, they were a middle class family that grew up there. So I, I really think it's a film about the middle class. It's about that kind of space uh, that uh, is, is, is very hard to hold on to. Um, we have some questions out here, I assume. Uh, I'll ask another one and then maybe just open things up if that makes sense. Um, um, one of the things, that, that, again, with it going back to this that, that issue, I mean, I, you know, with this film and with Love is Strange, uh, you, you can almost, they, they almost could be defined as issue films, but they're not issue films at all. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, everyone saw Love is Strange, right? Surely you did. Um, but, um, but uh, yeah, well, so uh, we, when it comes to the issue of gentrification, where, where does, uh, how do you see this film, I guess, contributing to that conversation? I like that I'm in a room where you can say everyone saw Love is Strange and people clap. This is a good, this is my audience, these are my people. <laughs> of course they do. It's not on. every room. Uh, uh, you know, to me this film, gentrification is a kind of word that's very much of this century, you might say. Um, the issues of land and money and um, uh, the struggles that people have to hold on to their property are ancient. Um, I have often thought about um, Jane Austen. Every Jane Austen book is either is about two subjects, love and money. They are the subjects in which we see uh, both drama and character. So for me, um, this is a film uh, about how these people deal with the struggles that are in front of them. And by making that very um, personal, in a way, by really trying to understand their, their challenges, I hope to make it not, I mean, I don't, to me, it's not an issue film, because it's about the stuff that everybody is always struggling with. Um, so we have any questions? They should come up to the mic. There's a mic. Oh, there's, oh yeah, how about that? There's actually a mic up here, if you can make your way there, or, you know. Hey, it's Tasha Robinson, film critic for The Verge. Hi, Tasha. <laughs> Um, I, was, I, was in, too close to the mic. I was interested in the fact that we never see anybody move into the storefront. Like, we see it empty, but we don't really know whether kicking Lenore out solved their financial problems. Was that an important part of the story to you, that that, that be left kind of open-ended? Well, I'd say, in general, I, I, I'm interested in films um, not being sort of, uh, the stories not being sort of, sewed up into a perfect kind of completion. Um, there is a, a sense, I think, in all my films that there is a future that is somewhat unknown, um, but you begin to, to have a connection to that future because of your connection to the characters. Um, I assume that that store will have someone in it soon enough. I think in a way what the empty store does is it tells you it has, it's been long enough that they cleared out, but not long enough that uh, someone new has come in. So in a way, it defines time as much as anything. Thank you. No. I'm interested to know why you picked the seagull as the play that Greg can hear Um That's a good question. Uh, I will give you a a couple of answers. Uh, one is that the initial play was, that they did was No Exit. 
and no exit is, um, which would also have been kind of funny, like the seagull is kind of funny, I think. Um, no exit, it turns out, is still in the estate of, of uh, Sartre. So we had to go about trying to get the rights to perform Sartre's No Exit. Um, after several months of doing so, it, it ended up that the person who was going to decide whether we could have the rights was Sartre's mistress. Um, he actually uh, was, uh, was involved with uh, Simone de Beauvoir at the time of his death, but he had a mistress who he gave all the rights to and all the decisions. She's about 95, and she lives in the south of France, and she said no. <laughs> so we were, we were sort of in a, in a, we were about three weeks from shooting. Uh, Mauricio and I had been working on a script uh, about the actor Montgomery Clift for oh, HBO sure. yeah. for the last uh, year. And there was a very important scene in the film and a very important production that Montgomery Clift did of The Seagull in New York. So we were both very familiar with The Seagull. And uh, it seemed, you know, Chekhovian was a good reference for the film and for the interests and for the structure of the story. So um, it also seems funny to me to see Greg Kinnear doing Chekhov. So. <laughs> and, and I have a second question. Um, the relationship of Lenore with the grandfather, I sometimes felt that there was an indication that there was something more personal there than just a business or a friend relationship. Is that something you intended to come across? It's something we thought about at various times, so I think there's a residual of those thoughts in a certain way. Ultimately, I decided, and I feel, that the film is about friendship, okay. and friendship takes many different forms. I believe, Leonore, that she had a deep daily friendship with this man, and I think the film also questions sort of what is family uh, in a really real way. Like, is it the people that you were born into, or is it the people that you've made lives with? And so um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with there being questions about that history. Uh, that's all I would say. Well, she seems to have known him well enough to, to really know what pressure points to, to hit, like really undermine him at a very crucial moment um, um, when they're back in the, in the backyard. Well, I think the film, you know, the title of the film refers certainly to the two boys, but in a way it refers to all the characters and specifically to Greg Kinnear's character, um, who at the beginning of the film loses his father. And, and, and I think for anyone, has to figure out what that means for himself about becoming a man, a parent, an adult. Um, it's a time of change for him. And um, so I think she, in a way, understands that. Yeah. And also feeling, yeah, just small, less than, less than um, you know, he's not, yes. he's not an earner. Yeah. Um, yes? Uh, the film is so much a companion piece to Love is Strange. I wondered if it arose out of loose ends or, um, alternate possibilities of the characters. Um, I guess you all can hear, because there's a microphone. Uh, I uh, know, I would say that there was an interest. We had made a film called Keep the Lights On, uh, previous to that, which was about two men in their 20s. Love is Strange was focused on two men in their 70s, 60s and 70s. And so we were interested in, in kind of a third film that dealt with relationships between uh, two male characters and a, and a kind of the third generation in a way. And, and I also um, wanted to make a kid, kid's film. People tell me that you can't make an art film, which is a kid's film, but that was my intention, to be honest. But it feels uh, so much of an ensemble piece, uh, also the Brooklyn setting and um, the way it shifts uh, perspectives. And uh, it seems very. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, they were made back to back. Yeah. These two films, um, uh, you know, two-year difference. So I think the I'm a 50-year-old man with four and a half-year-old twins, and um, you know, 75, 80-year-old parents. I feel very much in the middle of something, um, and and so this question. All of my films are very personal, I guess, and I think these questions of generations and responsibility are ones that I don't have to go very far to think about. They're very immediate to me. So I think they're interrelated because of, 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 of myself in some ways. Thank you. Um, you talked a little about, you talked about, I was just 
asking about the, the incompleteness, the, you know, leaving things open, not be, not too too tidy. Do you see yourself following through on Jake at at, at any point? Uh, because I think there is, you know, a glimmer of something in that in his friendship with um, with. Um, Okay, uh, with, Tony. with Tony, that he can't really uh, understand or, or identify. Um, um, do you really see, you see yourself returning to that territory yeah, as well? Antoine Doinel. So yeah, exactly, I, right. Um, I, well, it's interesting. My first film was called The Delta, and it's about a teenager a little older than these kids in Memphis, <coughs> Tennessee, and one of the characters is really sort of trying to figure out who he is, um, and he's, and he's um, a closeted gay teenager. I don't know if Jake is, is gay. I, 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 you know, there were times when the script flirted with making that decision. It felt totally something we could not decide for the character or the actor. It felt like an imposition. I think in some ways the film does lead to that next, it almost leads back to the Delta. And my hope is that this kid, whoever he becomes, doesn't quite have to go through the same things that kid did. That there's been some shift in time that makes his teenage years um, better. Uh, another question? Yes, I wanted to thank you. I think the uh, themes in the film are subtly provocative and relevant. And I kept my kids up late tonight, and I have twins, so um, I made that decision as a parent. So thank, thank you for you. giving us a dialogue to have that conversation about so many things. I wanted to speak um, or ask you to take a minute to talk about the theme, the scene with the teacher in the classroom and the idea of reverence and death in the poem and where that came from and what, why you left it so open-ended. Um, I will say that that teacher, Mauricio Bustamante, is um, Tony's teacher in real life in, in the acting school. Um, you know, one of the things I try to do is 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 kind of fluidly and, and sort of hopefully unselfconsciously bring the real world into my movies. So, um, you know, 90% of the film is scripted, but the other 10%, there are certain scenes like that scene um, where I've cast actually, those are all kids who are in acting programs and in New York, and they're all kids from the right neighborhood that we're talking about. They're very mixed in terms of their background. So, um, uh, the two of them, the actor Michael Barbieri and, and the acting teacher, know each other really well. And they were able to kind of go somewhere really free in doing that scene. The challenge was how long the scene should play. That was a very interesting, in, in editing we kept shifting it. Ultimately it seemed very important to kind of finish. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that we've done that. I will say that He's talking about the Sanford Meisner technique, um, this repetition exercise, and it's kind of blasphemy because they're in Lee Strasberg, which is method, the exact opposite school of acting. So I've kind of, you know, brought the uh, a kind of uh, conflict into the story. Um, the the poem is from Annabelle Lee by um, Edgar Allan Poe, and again in that scene, that was an actor, not a teacher who played that scene, but I, I wanted to somehow mess things up, and I, and I found that book in um, a, a bookshelf while we were shooting, and I said, read this, and I knew there would be no rights issues, because Edgar Allan Poe is pre-rights, so I knew we could have it if we needed it. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it was. worked, and I, it left it open-ended, and I appreciated the possibilities that it really brought on. Thank you for bringing your kids, and, and that's and, and you know I think it's a film for adults certainly, but I, I feel like I wish there was a, a kind of mechanism where kids were able to see um, films about serious stuff uh, in the cinemas, which I feel is is kind of lost these days. Well, if you're ever interested in showing it to their classes, let me know. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for you. Thanks. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Oh, one more. Uh, hi, I just to ask uh, about some uh, film influences other than Ozu that you've had for this film. Yes. Um, uh, I have been, ex my whole career, I would say for the last 20 years, been very influenced by a French filmmaker named Maurice Piala, um, who is kind of
kind of um, very naturalistic filmmaker who's not a, uh, afraid of sort of holding scenes a little longer than you expect and allowing you to get in a little deeper than you, you might have thought you were. Um, he also shoots very specifically in the same framing that you see in this movie, which is a kind of medium shot visually. Um, every shot, in a way, is its own form of portraiture. So the shots are not um, telling you exactly what to feel. They're allowing you to have some space and, and connection um, that is still respecting your own kind of response to, to the characters. Um, I, I, you know, Truffaut was a big influence, of course. The Four Blows is a, an amazingly exciting film, which is something, films like The, um, the Red Balloon was, was a film that I thought a lot about. Um, uh, those are some, you know, I guess French cinema has been very important to me. Um, 